Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, and welcome to Court. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Sasha de Boyle, Director of the Court International Festival of Literature, and I'm really excited to be introducing you to our first ever digital festival. I hope you enjoyed this event, and if you do, why not take a moment to see what else we have in store online at court.ie. All our events will be broadcast live until the 25th of April, but if you want to watch or listen again, you can find them all online on our website, our SoundCloud or our YouTube channel. Please feel free to join the conversation on social media. We'll be using the hashtag Court2020 across Facebook, Twitter and Instagram throughout the weekend. If you'd like to make a donation to support Court, you can do so at court.ie forward slash support us. And after the event, we'll be sending out a post event survey and would be very grateful if you were able to fill this in. We can't bear with you, but we hope we can bring a little of the Court spirit to you wherever you are in the world. Thank you. And just in case nobody else has uh, done it so far, um, I think Sasha deserves enormous plaudits for putting together this festival digitally. I know Anne and myself were supposed to be in Galway tonight, doing this in the old fashioned way in front of uh, people in a room. Uh, and instead Sasha has managed to take huge chunks of the festival and put it all together here digitally so that it has survived. Um, huge congratulations to her for this. My name is Rick O'Shea, this is Courage 2020, and with me in the other screen is Anne Enright. Hello, Anne. Hi, Rick, how do you do? This is strange and unusual in terms of doing one of these things, in that I'm in my house in Inchcore, you're in your house out in Wicklow, and uh, in theory, both of us are supposed to be in, in Galway tonight. How, uh, how, how have you been getting on over the last, the last four or five weeks with all of all of this? Um, it's hard to, I don't even know what to say about all of that yet. Um, we were kind of settling down grand actually until I clicked on Trump last night and he recommended that everyone drink bleach or whatever. And I lay awake in a state of great alarm for, for four hours or something thinking, oh my God, oh my God, what is it? What is it? Um, I, I, you know, writers don't, uh, there's nothing about 30 years at the desk that prepares you for an event like this that you can just you know roll off some handy sentences about who we all are and where we're all going this is just something that we're going to have to live through and think about for a very long time to come and i don't know what it means for books except i see people's eagerness and hunger for both distraction and the kind of completion that literature can give you in your afternoon a sense of uh, substance so it hasn't been bad for thinking, put it that way. It hasn't been bad for, you know, it's been, if you can manage the dread, I suppose, uh, then the days are long and long days are full of opportunity. I, I saw you write in, in an article in, in The Guardian recently just about this. You said, there's a lot to be said for tooling around all day. I'm, I'm with you in that. I believe that tooling around all day is a kind of, it's a lost art. It kind of creates a little bit of maybe boredom out of which creativity comes. Do, do you think that? Yeah, mooching around. I mean, boredom is uh, is is fierce in some ways because it uh, brings all your demons out of the walls. But actually, writers are used to sitting there for however weeks or months and looking at the walls and <laughs> dealing one way or another with the feelings that might arise. It's not entirely a Zen state or a meditative state, but we are uh more used to the feeling of lockdown as it were actually i'm kind of a bit worried that when the lockdown lifts i'll have nowhere to go <laughs> it'll be oh 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 my normal life is now not the normal life but i mean the opportunity to meet the readers uh, is really um is a great great loss actually because i've always got such a, a, an amazing amount of sustenance from I mean, readers are not uncritical. They they have things to say to you, but they they like to make the connection. And the connection that you make on the page is this uh, the, the imaginative connection is very precious, you know. And then meeting people for real um, is uh, so it can be kind of alarming. Actually, you write all these things, and then there are people who are right there, you know. Um, 
and I miss that very much. I miss it particularly with the Irish readership um, uh, who are, you know, they're really on it, you know, they read everything. I'm going to start back at, at, at pretty much the beginning. You were the youngest of five children. Was that a household that it was hard to get heard in or was it easy to get heard? Was it quite democratic? Was, was, you're saying was that a household in which it was hard to be heard? Rick, I don't know where you're getting your past tense from. <laughs> it, it is, I'm still the youngest of five and that's not gonna change. Um, my mother is in her 90s. She was the youngest of four and she still complains about the fact that nobody listens to her one way or the other. It, it, it You know, sibling order doesn't ever change. It's one of those givens. Uh, yeah, it's a pretty, yeah, you stick your elbows out, lift your voice. It was that kind of house. It was an, an unusual uh, uh, situation for your family and that there's some wonderful stories. I heard you tell them recently, one of which was, I mean, even just about your mum and about the circumstances of, of her birth in that she was born after her father had passed away. Yeah, it was a long time ago. And it's amazing how these uh, sort of um, these biological, historical connections last for such a long time. Yeah, she's, my mother was a posthumous child. It meant she had... Uh, um, uh, gifts, apparently, folklorically, if you're a posthumous child born after your father dies. But it was this uh, sort of amazing, quite folkloric idea that even by being born, you could be in some way extraordinary. So when I started out as a writer and, and, and uh, continued as a writer, I look around at what looks like normality to me. And it doesn't, it, it always has a kind of mythic dimension. It always has a sense of uh, potential consequence or size or tragedy or interest, you know, coincidence, all of those kind of things. I think they're in our DNA. They're in the way we make each other. We make children, we make our lives and our families. So, um, yeah, uh, that was a very early instance of all of that out in Fibsborough back in 1900 and whatever it was. What, what were you like as a reader growing up? Were there lots of books in the house? Were you voracious? What were you like? Um, well, you know, people, uh, uh, Irish people, I don't know. Uh, uh, looking back on it now, yes, we were all readers and there were books in the house and we went to the library every week. And I went to the library after school in Rathmines every day when I was five or six. And I read through all the books in the children's library and uh, I um, tried to blag my way into the adult library. And of course, being Irish, they didn't you know, have a big uh, uh, speech to make about all of that. They just let me in and then didn't give me any assistance whatsoever. So I was <laughs> then loose in the adult stacks in Rathmines Library. I still remember the green lino, very institutional lino, and the, and the brass and the blondy kind of honey coloured bookshelves and looking at one after the other, completely incomprehensible volume at the age of seven. And then I, I, I went out again and they said, bye now. <clears throat> and that was that really, on <laughs> my reading in Ratmine's library. So there were lots of, there were lots of books. Um, and being the youngest of five, everybody went through school and the Leaving Cert and then on to college and they had their own collection of books. So, you know, my, my brother liked Thomas Hardy, my sister liked some, uh, you know, my other brother liked science fiction. It was a great mix of things that you could steal, a great sense of possessiveness about people's, very small bookshelves that we had in our house and uh, it's quite territorial and quite interesting yeah i had no real sense of it until i, I was in the audience when you gave a, a lecture when margaret atwood was in dublin a little over a year ago and you ended up talking about your time that you spent in canada when you were a teenager that's that you know just as you told the story and again as i read it in a lecture later on that seemed like quite an extraordinary adventure for for someone who was that age yeah, I was 16 and I finished my leaving cert in Louis Rath Mines and uh, two of the teachers said, look, here's an ad in the Irish Times. I was supposed to uh, become an au pair for a year in Germany. Some lucky German family was spared my ministrations. Some, <laughs> some fortunate and healthy German child was spared me at the age of 16. And instead I applied for a scholarship to this amazing school in Canada and my but my parents are hardwired to the word scholarship. You couldn't turn a scholarship down. So they let me go. Yeah. Before I knew it, I was in Amsterdam airport meeting this group of international students and then on a big, huge bellied fucking 
excuse my language, huge plane going over the Rockies um, for for the first time across the Juan de Fuca Strait and at ferry and uh, in the way that adolescents feel that all good things are, of course, due to them. Why would it be any other way? I didn't think this was extraordinary. I felt it was meant and quite right. And I didn't feel privileged or lucky, as I now feel looking back in, in retrospect. It was two years that I don't I don't ever write about because it was slightly out of the normal experience. It was an interna small international school that loads of lovely Canadian funding. Everybody ran around cutting down trees and going up mountains. I stayed up late and smoked and talked, talked. <laughs> That's what I did. And um, uh, and I didn't need my goddamn exams. So it was like a, a, an amazing holiday. And some of those people that I met then, I, I met one of them just uh, in London a couple of weeks ago um, after 30, 40 years. Um, we know each other on a kind of strange level, the way you know the, the friends of your youth, the guys you ran around with when you were eight or nine. There was a real, uh, a real bond was established there. Also, was I met lots end? of people, a lots of people who weren't in any way like we were. And and I think Irish families in, have a great, I don't know if it's arrogance is the right word, but uh, the, the 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 Irish clan has a great sense that the way that the way that they are is the way that people are, but actually, mm. not really, not necessarily. Lots of people, you know, aren't Catholic, for example. Shocking. You must have, have been. And, and, uh, absolutely. And maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but me in the Canada of of the time, you must have had freedoms that certainly you definitely wouldn't have had if you if you'd stayed back home. You know, it's kind of weird. I find I've always thought that Canada is quite a moral place. If you do something wrong in Canada, they want to tell you that you've done something wrong. And then they tell you again until you've admitted that it really was not the right thing to do. They are very communal. They're, I mean, it's terrible to make large kind of statements about one country or another. But Canadians are not, uh, uh, not, a, not you know, they're, they're, they're not... Uh, conservative in the Catholic mode, but they're not entirely liberal either. They have strong values from living with bad weather for <laughs> for centuries, and you know they're so, they're different from America. They're, they're, there's a lot going on in Canada. Um, I, I do want to talk about the, the new book about actress. I want to get to that, but before I, I don't want to skip over in any way um, being the the laureate for fiction. Uh, I want to ask you about what it was like when you found out initially when you got the phone call, not just that you were to become the laureate for fiction, but that you were the first, the inaugural one. How how did that feel? I got a phone call from Paul Muldoon. And I had known Paul Muldoon in UEA in the University of East Anglia in 1985-86 when I was there. Paul was a writer fellow for a uh, term before he went off to Princeton where he has taught ever since. So he had been an extremely pleasant addition to my year in Norwich in the University of East Anglia. He was so hospitable and, and really gentle, welcoming sort of presence. And so Paul Muldoon rang me up and said, I'd like to tell you that, you know, you're the laureate for Irish fiction. And then he passed me the phone along the members of the committee. And he did it quite formally. It was quite beautiful. and. Um, it that that series of conver short conversations I had with the committee made it feel like such a an estimable, uh, uh, you know, such a an, an, an honor, an honor. He did it very, very, very well. Did you have any sense that that was something that was happening somewhere at the time or, or, or was it a complete um, surprise for you? I can't remember, actually. I can't actually remember what the process was. I mean, I must, I must have, there must have been some kind of conversations with people about uh, how open they were to the prospect because it's a job as well as an honor. Um, there was an amount of, uh, you know, old fashioned work involved one way or the other. Um, I was writing lectures and I was teaching then as a consequence of it. And that was also uh, interesting. I mean, it brought me further along one way or the other. I mean, I, I, or, or, I wonder what would have happened if I'd written a book during that time instead and brought it out before the world turned dark. But, um, uh, you know, if you asked me three months ago, I would have said, actually, yes, that had been a great thing for, for my own 
sense of myself as a creative artist, as well as a sense of the culture and the tradition that, that we have here in Ireland. Um, if, if people haven't had the chance to do it already, I highly recommend that they read the, the beautiful collection of um, your writings and lectures from then called No Authority. It's beautifully put together. Um, I, I just wanted to briefly ask you about one of the lectures uh, uh, in it, the Call Yourself George one, um, the one about Catherine Nichols. Maybe just tell us a, a, a little bit about that. And, and I wanted to ask you if you think that a lot has changed since you wrote that between then and now. Yeah, there was a kind of dissonance in Ireland, even, you know, in 2012, 2013, we had other things on our mind, um, uh, clearly, other than uh, things like gender, we'd had the crash, we had, you know, being Irish was already uh, so much, um, so, so much to think about, that we, we have always been rather at an angle to the mainstream feminist movements of the UK and uh, the United States. So um, that was a kind of surprise to me that things hadn't changed because a lot of my career prior to the laureateship, I had turned to outside of Ireland. You go more or less where it, I think writing is hard enough. So you just go where you really feel welcomed. And that had not been for me within a kind of very small cultural mindset, uh, not with the readership, but uh, there's a fairly small cultural mindset within Ireland. So when I, I turned back to Ireland as doing in the laureateship thing and looked at it very hard. And I said, hang on, lads, there, this is still going on. Um, and, and, and when women complain about it, it's, it's considered to be a kind of uh, an unnecessary and slightly irritating noise. Um, a, 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 a lot of things in those years changed from being women just complaining into a real force for change. And the Me Too movement was part of that. Uh, you know, p women complaining about being groped and you think, oh, well, yeah, but what do you expect, you know? But that actually changed because women said, no, we actually don't expect. So I think similar, uh, similar things were happening in literature where you were looking, I was looking at the gender imbalance and the representation of women in the uh, it, it say the reviews in the newspapers as an example of how much space, time and importance is given to their words. And I found that um, it was the situation was really much worse than you might expect. So I broke it down. Catherine Nichols, who I took as an example, was a woman who wrote a, a book and sent it off to 25 agents and got turned down. And she decided to call herself George instead. And she got eight times more interest for the same text, the same book, when it was written by a man as by a woman. So this is a hugely complicated thing. What is it when people look at the page and they think a woman is speaking or they think a man is speaking? Uh, it has to do with the readership, but one of the things that you can really uh, put down in statistical cold facts is how it plays out um, on the page, in the newspapers, in the libraries and the bookshops. So I did that for fun. Do you think anything has changed then since you wrote that? You know, by the time I called it, I think it had already changed. Rick, I was like, you know, um, the, you, the, the, the importance of women's importance in itself is a very problematic word. The, er, the necessity for what women were writing, the sense of necessity, the sense of that something essential and something that was that something shifting was being put down on the page. When you look at people like Emma McBride or Anna Burns or Sally Rooney, that urgency has translated into global sales and recognition. So it was already on the move by the time I called it. Um, I think if people I get the chance as well, as a, no, it's okay. You can you can fire the dog. Uh, as the a, dog. I have a I have a slight aside to do anyway. If people get a chance, the uh, Emma McBride interview from last night uh, from here, Kurt, is still available, and it was it was super. It was really good. Um, your uh, before I start talking to you about actress, I wanted to briefly ask you about your own theatre years when that that brief period of whatever months when you were uh, a fully fledged uh, working actor. Yeah, I, I'm actually waiting for the dog to be taken out for his walk. Yeah, bye 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 dog. Uh, yeah, I, I, after when I was in Trinity, um, after I came back from Canada, I was in Trinity College. 
Dublin and the people I was hanging out with were all actors and players and they all, not all of them, but they became Rough Magic Theatre Company, which is one of the most enduring, you know, theatre companies mm -hmm. doing new work in Ireland uh, in the last 30 years. But they started out, uh, I was right there with them, uh, uh, which was again uh, a great privilege. So I worked in uh, one of the first productions there for Rough Magic Top Girls. I played Dulbrett and Angie. Uh, so I was an actress. I was being paid. I was doing auditions. I had to go into uh, Casualty and Vincent's once for a really minor thing. And they asked me what I did. And I said, I'm an actress. I was actually on the stage in the project in the evening that day. And the woman behind the glass in the cubicle, she wrote down unemployed. <laughs> and I said, I was an actress. <laughs> and then she said, what is your religion? I brazenly said none. And she wrote down Roman Catholic. Anyway. I was earning my uh, a couple of shillings on the stage. I did a few auditions. I was going to, I suppose everybody I knew wanted to be an actor and, uh, and actually there were very few people who wanted to be directors. That was a good thing to want to be because I don't know, everybody wants to get up there and be the thing. Um, I got a phone call from Gary Hines one day in April, the year after I left uh, college. And she said, would you like to play the maid in an upcoming um, uh, uh, production of Dracula? And then I got a phone call from RTE on the same day saying that they were doing a prison series and would I like to join in the pilot writers group? And it was one day in April in 1985, I think. And I chose, I mean, playing the maid, all respect to the wonderful Gary Hines. But I did see a life ahead of me where I would be playing the maid. Or maybe later, the kind of, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, figure it out. But it, there were so few, there were so few uh, rounded, interesting parts for women uh, that I, among other things, I couldn't face a whole lifetime of dieting and being turned down. Dieting and being turned well, down. That's what an actor's life is. My, my, my thought might have been, was there another road, the two roads diverging at first, and one of which in which you, you became a theatre director or one in which you, you, you wrote for the theatre? It's a really interesting question, Rick, because I couldn't be a theatre director because I am very bad at getting people to do things. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> That's part of the job, yeah. Yeah, I'm very bad at making shapes of people in my head. I am much more the actor as I write than I am the director, even as I write the books. But I suppose when you write the books, you can move them around. But I grow them from the inside. I, I, I do it by improvisation, not from outside manipulating them into one or other structure or plot. You probably can tell from the result that that's how I do it. But it is, it, it's, it's an internal to external sort of creative path for me. Talk to me about the new novel, uh, about uh, actress, about Catherine, about Nora. Maybe you just briefly describe the, the, the book to us and, and what goes on in it. Um, actress is about a female actor, an actor called Catherine O'Dell, um, who is a wonderful, nostalgic, famous, redheaded, uh, Irish actor who incidentally was born in England, not Ireland at all. And she, uh, her story is told by her daughter, Nora O'Dell, who's also a, a creator of, of, of a kind. She's a, a, a writer, much more quiet minded, much more controlled sort of person. Catherine is full of dramatics, full of performance and melodramatics and She's she's a, she's big, and her daughter is telling the story of her life and telling the story of how she ended up shooting somebody in the foot in Dublin in 1983. So um, read something. Uh, yeah, from read. The book. This is the first page. People ask me what was she like, and I try to figure out if they mean as a normal person, what was she like in her slippers eating toast and marmalade, or what was she like as a mother. Or what was she like as an actress? We did not use the word star. Mostly though, they mean, what was she like before she went crazy? As though their own mother might turn overnight like a bottle of milk left out of the fridge 
or they might themselves be secretly askew. Something happens as they talk to me. I'm used to it now. It works in them slowly, a growing wonder, as though recognizing an old flame after many years. You have her eyes, they say. People loved her. Strangers, I mean. I saw them looking at her and nodding, but they failed to hear a single word, she said. And yes, I have her eyes. At least I have the same color eyes as my mother, a hazel that in her case, people like to call green. Indeed, whole paragraphs were penned about bog and field when journalists looked into my mother's eyes. And we have the same way of blinking, slow and fond as though thinking of something very beautiful. I know this because she taught me how to do it. Think about cherry blossoms, she said, drifting on the wind. And sometimes I do. Such were the gifts I got from Catherine O'Dell, star of stage and screen. How are you, O oh mother of mine? Never better, she used to say. And the blossoms drifted by the tree load when she looked at me. There was a man in the kitchen in Dartmouth Square, where everything important in my life seems to have happened, who knew someone who had slept with Marilyn. And never washed, he said. Some evening in my childhood, I came down the stairs to hear this news, and he was such a nice old man, it stained me ever since. So when people ask, what was she like? I have an urge to say, pretty clean, actually, and then to add, I mean, by the standards of the day. I feel like in the absence of the audience, I should be the one uh, applauding, because that's normally where that goes in, in an event like this. Um, we spoke recently on the book show on Radio 1, just about the, the research that you'd done, the books that you had read about the nature of relationships in those kind of showbiz families. Maybe tell us a, a little bit about, about some of that. Yeah, I suppose I had avoided and read, I mean, I read years ago, Postcards from the Edge and Wishful Drinking by Carrie Fisher. And Carrie Fisher and Debbie Reynolds is uh, the child and the mother on the book. Um, and they had this amazing relationship, as you may remember, they died within days of each other. And Carrie Fisher was, was as it were, the mad one in that relationship. She had bipolar disorder and addiction issues. She wrote in, in Wishful Drinking that her mother uh, had a wardrobe that was that you had an entrance and an exit so that she entered into this room clearly full of clothes as her mother and came out as Debbie Reynolds. Um, and I think we're all, we all know what that is actually, one way or the other. Um, for many years, I thought of perfume as the smell of my mother going out into the world, that the scent of your mother leaving is, you know, Givenchy tree or whatever it was uh, that she wore, Paco Rabanne, uh, Tweed by Lontheric, all of those. Anyway, so that kind of uh, glamour infused nostalgia is something that we all know. And there's an amount of it in the book about Ireland in the 60s and 70s. Um, so then there's uh, Joan Crawford and Mommy Dearest. I don't know if I read it so much as I think, you know, the wire hangers and all of that. Uh, I mean, Joan Crawford was was an amazingly mad person um, and sh she adopted her children but, uh, who, who, who disagree about how bad she was to them. There's a son who didn't seem to suffer so much and a daughter who wrote Mommy Dearest as an act of great revenge. Um, Nora, who is Catherine O'Dell's daughter, isn't interested in outing her private mother as being completely different from the glamorous reality that Hollywood would have uh, suggested. She's more interested in retaining a kind of sweetness of possession of her mother, uh, despite the many images that went out of her into the world. There's another relationship in, in this book, of course, and I read in, a, I think, in a review recently where it was described as the celebration of a happy monogamous long-term relationship and of course that's Nora's relationship with her husband some people rick have said that the celebratory aspect is rather muted <laughs> there is not at the end of the slightly <laughs> there is at the end of the book a description that there's an awful lot about absent the, her husband who tells her to write the damn book and stop going on about it all you know, he's heard about it for years 
Um, Nora's husband is continually absent. She lives in this kind of echoing writerly existence where the rooms are a puzzle of different absences, her children, her husband, or her husband is asleep. Finally, towards the end of the book, the book gathers enough momentum and enough emotional sort of uh, weight for her to describe more or less that very shifting thing, which is the relationship between two people. Um, I ha it had been one of my interests before I started writing this book, because not only uh, was I interested in the fact that an awful lot of sex in books is very bad as sex goes? And I wondered why that is the case in books. And is it also the case in life? And, and, and what is the actual truth of all of that? And why is the truth somehow unavailable to the literary world? Why are there so few? I mean, Bernard McLaverty's Mid Midwinter Break is an exception recently. But why are there so few books about uh, something that is more or less common in the world, which is long-term relationships that stick and stay. Adam Phillips, the uh, psychoanalyst um, analyst wrote a book called Monogamy, which seemed to be a book not about monogamy, about everything other than monogamy. It was so hard to settle on this central fact or this central thing. So that shiftingness and that inaccessibility was really interesting. So when I came to describe the, the marriage, one way or the other, these people are changing all the time and they're changing through decades. But there is something that remains essentially, you know, it's just kind of the mystery of who human beings are if you know them for a very long time. I suppose you know yourself for a very long time too. And you say, well, am I the same person I was when I was 19? Um, yes, is the short answer. So I wanted to show all the irritations and all the push me pull use and all the impossibilities about loving somebody full stop or loving somebody for a long time. Um, I, I read elsewhere as well, somebody had said that the book was about people who were trapped by their own mythologies like flies and ember. I, I quite like that idea. Is that something that in particular interests you? Well, the thing about Catherine O'Dell was, uh, going back to the, the role of the maid, um, that she goes through a number of iterations. I mean, she's on stage as the girl in the nighty. She's the girl in the nighty. How many girls have you seen on in nighties on the stage? That's one of the things, you know, who are you going to be? <laughs> anyway, so she goes through various sort of second hand, second class fictions, mostly but de delightful, deli you know, the audiences love it. I mean, this kind of thing we watch nonstop, all these plotted, wonderful, me slightly melodramatic dramas. But she's, in one art or another of them, she's playing a very, uh, a s s not just secondary, a kind of, um, a kind of projection, a kind of un unreal role, whatever the imagined ac a woman is in that particular drama. So she's constantly, she, and then later on, she starts to try and find roles for herself. She tries to write monologues. She tries to hustle some work in the movie industry by saying, look, this part will be interesting or that part will be interesting. And actually the number of role models that are available to her to write about are also really limited. It's not like she can write El Seed or Braveheart. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> When, when an actor says, oh, I'd like to play a part, what's it going to be? Why can't I be up on a horse with a, with a big sword? It's endlessly women who have had a hard time one way or the other or who have been put down or failed or who, who are brave in a way that punishes them in the long term. And history is full of those goddamn characters. Um, so it is, it's a permanent challenge to try and elbow your way out of those kind of fictions about into new possibilities i i loved your desert island discs um recently and i came to realize that your choice in music and mine overlapped a lot leonard cohen and tom waits and, and johnny cash and even the um, to, to be fair which was played in my house much when i was a kid my dad's a major trad music fan um is music something that's important to you in your life um, yeah, I, I live with musical people. I'm the least musical person in my in the house, so I get a lot of secondhand music. I get other people's playlists, which are really good. My own, you know, doing something for Desert Island Discs, it was like carving out your goddamn tombstone. <laughs> it, was like, it was really hard. Um, 
And also, I'm really bad at people, uh, you know, there and younger women are e easier about this. That they're they they're not apologetic about their taste in music. But for me, it was always, oh, you like them. So all there was always a cooler band, and there were always people who knew more about music and who knew everything about music and whose tastes were somehow more uh, refined or interesting. Anyway, music is a very personal thing. I used to play Glenn Gould all the time, like a lot of uh, artists and writers play Glenn Gould. And I had six discs and I wore them out, uh, six CDs that I, uh, um, and I played them nonstop. And now they make me feel slightly nauseous <laughs> because it it's, I, you know, I... means I'm working. I, I found those 1955 recordings, the ones you talked about, they're, they're fantastic. Yeah. They've been remastered recently. They're absolutely great. And, and you know, I did, well, you, you, reckon you talked about Joni Mitchell as well. I think your list was immensely cool. Yeah, thank you, Rick. You see, uh, I don't have that confidence. I, I need you to tell me that. <laughs> yeah, who was cooler yeah, than Joni Mitchell? Eh? What's cooler than Joni, Joni Mitchell? I, I, I haven't that would be actually... My as well. I haven't exposed that list to my children's scorn. Okay, Which, that seems fair. You know, yeah. Um, no. Tell me a, a little bit about teaching, because obviously that that's something you've done in in the last few years. Is was that something you enjoy? I really enjoy it. I was actually uh, told to some students this morning um, in this new world going online, um, and it's kind of you know it's really nice to see people, and it's an interesting distance there with the screen, and uh, you know. Uh, amazing to think that everybody's in their houses uh, thinking and, and working away and trying to to make make a way through this time um yeah and and the hope that the the, the the working towards future books is really the thing i really love about teaching i'm not, i don't love uh, declaring things about literature to large groups of people because i don't know things about literature but i do like meeting somebody's work on the page and i do like discussing it uh, uh, one in small groups or one to one, and and I'm I, I that's how I prefer to work in UCD, where I work in the creative writing MA mostly in the MFA in in UCD, and I really enjoy it. I um, I, you know, American writers do nothing but complain <clears throat> privately and quietly about the fact they have to teach, because they need it for their health insurance. Um, and it's a huge imposition, <laughs> um, but I, I wouldn't be doing it on, on, unless I really found it sustaining and interesting. Um, and it is a way of bringing my interest in the Irish tradition a bit further on, not that all the students are Irish, but I just, you know, keeping it fresh, keeping new voices coming through. Is it true that most of your books live downstairs in your basement? Yes. They do, yeah. I was just, I was, I was just interested. You wrote about it recently, and you said that you got a very small amount of books out where people can see them, and then all the rest of them are, I know, are, I are kept hidden thing. away elsewhere. I wrote this thing. It was in the. I wrote this thing, and then I not that I regretted it, but I, I mean, I regret it, <laughs> I regret it all. But um, yeah, I admitted to the fact. I didn't say the stupidest thing. If you want to hear the stupidest thing, which is. Uh, I read a feng shui thing many decades ago that said books are like knives. <laughs> in, in terms of interior decoration, <laughs> books are like knives coming at you. So, and that made huge amounts of sense to me. Um, so I don't like, uh, I never, I, I mean, just, I'm just odd. I didn't, I don't like people picking up my books and saying, what's this like? Because I don't know what, I, and is this good? I used to I used to have a friend who would say, "Is this any good?" And if you said yes, they would take it. So, oh, I'll read it. <laughs> Back in the days when Ireland was one big library, I don't know if. Uh, anyway, I I don't I'm I'm I don't I'm 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 a bit neurotic about all of that. I mean, I read hugely for many decades. Now I look at my books and I say, "Is that all a bit eighties?" I think that's why I've gotten rid of most of mine. A lot of mine have disappeared, and I remember reading certain things 10, 15, 20 years ago. And I, there's a copy of it here somewhere. And it's I, I clear out stuff much more frequently th than that. What you see behind you here, and, and there's a couple of more shelves about the same size upstairs. That's that's the whole lot. But again, I'm not mad about people touching mine either. That's fair. 
Yeah, oh, really? Oh, really? Well, that's good to hear. Now, I've uncovered all that because people are doing nothing but boast about their books all the nonstop. <laughs> you open the newspapers and people say, oh, I've just been reading yada yada, something much more obscure than Proust. And, and that's been very, you know, I find that very interesting. But actually, they're probably online clicking uh, through Trump's latest uh, stupidity or whatever. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that they're all lying, but I can't. They're, they're too personal and they're too much part of my machine, you know, the, that, that, that I'm thinking about them. I'm not always judging them. And uh, that is one of the things I find challenging about the critical discourse, that you don't necessarily write in order to be judged. You write in order to make something and to meet people on the page in a way um that isn't about judgment it is about closeness or it's about m musing or it's about setting sparks going um and it's not necessarily about i mean book book clubs can be quite judgy it's quite it's very interesting how people want to control the content of the book so if you're a writer like me who writes books that can't or won't be controlled or go somewhere unexpected or somewhere where they they just want to, go. That, that seems to be the necessary path for the book to go. I get uh, some kickback from people saying, why is that what you have done? As if you've done something wrong. And actually all I've done is follow what I have on the page to its best conclusion. And that conclusion might be have surprises along the way. But people can be kind of conservative in how they want a book to be structured and they want to possess it in some way and control it in some way and i'm not good at delivering a controlled book my books do whatever they want to do sadly is it is this book then a, a strange experience for you insofar as you would normally have that not quite two-way conversation but you would have that kind of feedback from people about the book and people would have opinions you would maybe would meet them with this one because of where we all are right now there's there's a vacuum no, I, um, because the online space is just much more busy than it used to be. Um, and when you, the, in the beginning of Amazon reviews and everything, people screaming at you saying, don't read them, don't read them, whatever you do, don't read your reviews on Amazon. And of course, like five books ago, I was glued to them. I was like looking up who <laughs> is, <laughs> who is Mr. Two Shoes, who says, you know, um, uh, and, you know, <laughs> you know, now I would scan them from a from a distance, but I'm quite interested in what both the broad picture and then the individual responses, which can be quite striking and and, and heartening as well. Um, that people get one or another thing out of the book. Um, a lot, I was very fortunate in the timing that most of the reviews had uh, had passed by the uh, you know in February, and the re reviews never teach you anything except they do tell you how the book is doing, and that kind of echo chamber is useful in a if you're really careful with your your how you hear it um but usually a book takes a year because i would be on tour now in germany i would be in tour i was going to go to italy and then there are all the festivals of which Korch is one and so it is difficult to feel that a book has properly finished until you've done the cycle of promotion these days um, and when I was uh, had to return from America and that cycle of promotion was rudely interrupted, I felt very strongly that the book was more close to being finished and done as a process and that I might turn more quickly this time to, to the next one, actually. Well, given that you've just said it out loud, how, how is that process going? Are you, are you in the beginnings of turning to the next one? How, how do you operate? How How is that going? Yeah, well, as I as I as you noticed, and I wrote in the Guardian, I'm I'm tooling around, um, and I'm putting I put down little bits and pieces. And usually, it's at late at night, you know, or late in the day after I'm working a little bit on some reviewing and reading, um, and I'm idling through those books that nobody ever sees because they're too embarrassing or too personal or too close to me. <laughs> Just looking at voice and looking at past tense writers often think in terms of a shape or a mood um and i am i have some stuff yeah i have some stuff 
yeah which is as good as you can ask from anyone i have some stuff is it really that's a, that's a good declaration of yeah. where, where your creative process it's really, is right it is actually very difficult at the moment because you can't see the future uh, and you never could see the future but you had the illusion that you saw a future you would know where a book was going to land um and so it's very difficult to write into serious uncertainty but there are prior uncertainties that you can take as examples of how people wrote in 1919. I was looking at F. Scott Fitzgerald actually, um, because he had this, you know, he was, he was, uh, he, he wrote during the Spanish flu. Um, and how would you know that from what he wrote? Or at Beckett post World War II. I mean, there are things that you can, you can think about how other people have gone through very critical moments in history, very, serious undoings of, of all our certainties and what, what art came out of that. And, and, and that's a huge project, but I, I, and I'm no further on or nor would I claim to be, but I do know that it continues. I do trust that it continues. I do know that the necessary words do come back and that, that, that speech that means something becomes available again. So, um, so I have, I have a great kind of confidence in that. Is, is there a greater question to be asked? And maybe it's something I've, I've thought about over the last while in that if if the worlds that we are currently living in right now for what in one form or another continues for the next six months, 12 months, 18 months, maybe just it's that we're just all socially distancing ourselves from each other and we all have to be careful about the number of people who end up in the shop and if people have to stay away from each other. What sort of literature comes from that do you think that if that lasts long enough it will it will change the sort of stories that are being that are being told well there are so many layers to that question i can't see the future but if i was looking at the moment say last year um and saying it's i would i'm interested in 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 this book and in all my work in in ideas of connection and disconnection so and I was intrigued that kind of chillier sort of writers were more valued by, in some ways, not necessarily by the wide readership, by the critical readership. He said, well, why do they want chilly? Why do they want chilly books by women? Why am I not writing a chilly book? I can't really write a chilly book. So those are the, so those are, those are the questions that you ask about contemporary culture and your own place in it. Uh, and they're creative questions rather than marketing questions. Um, I, books for me take two or three years. So that's my out of your question there. Any, in any case, a lot of writers aren't down the shops all the time. Yeah. <laughs> They're in their room. They're isolated already, you know? So that sense of, I don't know, I, I think some fierce stuff must come out of this some fierce wanty uh, writing, you know, about touch and about connection um, if, we're, if we're distant for a long time. I, I'm thinking of writing about something small that was cancelled. <laughs> There's a lot of inspiration for that um, knocking around at the moment. Um, I, I wanted, before we finished again, because I, I heard it elsewhere, you were talking about um, Martin, your husband, and about him being your first reader usually for, for for material although as as you said when i heard you say it he's your first listener as opposed to your first reader yeah no there's a bit, bit of a control scrabble there <laughs> it's like yeah no i say listen to this and he says no i'll read it and i said no you can't read it it's a bit like the books on the you know what to just settle down into something so so i would read it aloud and reading reading aloud and uh, and then, uh, yeah. So um, I know I'm. I know I'm cooking. I know I'm doing something when I want to, him to hear it. He doesn't always want to hear it, however. But there you go. And can it's you tell from the reaction you know? that you're getting? Uh, can you tell from the reaction you're getting? You know wh whether or not it's something that you know you're, you're going to. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, early on, he went on strike, and uh, you know the week my father wore, and I was reading the thirtieth anxious draft that was very close to the twenty ninth anxious draft, and saying it's completely different. And he's saying, no, it's like, no, it seems like the same to me. Uh, and, and you, can't, there's nothing good you can say to a writer. You meet a writer with silence. And the writer will read your silence in, 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 in perhaps the right way. So he has 50 different kinds of silence. There might be a, hmm, 
or you know he also has quite different ideas about uh about fiction to to mine and i know that now as well so you have to know your reader very 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 well um, I, I think it's almost time for us to, to, to finish up. This has been a, an unusual and an, an exceptional experience. And hopefully the next time we do this, it will be in a real room full of people and uh, at, a, at a festival where uh, there are lots of other things happening around us. But I, I think this has, been a, this has been an interesting one. It's been great, Rick. And the next time I tell you, I'll wear shoes. <laughs> I, so I can make no such problem. Um, if you want to buy some of Anne's books, normally Anne would be leaving the room, going outside and signing books for you, but instead you can buy them from the Festival Bookseller, which is Charlie Burns. If you look up Charlie Burns' website, you'll find details of that there. The book is Actress. It's an absolutely fantastic, exceptional read. I've been banging on about it for many months now. Um, and it's definitely one of the ones that will uh, get you, keep you going through the, the situation that we're all in now. Um, Anne Enright, it's been lovely. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rick. It's been real. Okay.